X at Six Flags Magic Mountain. This ambitious roller coaster was set to revolutionize the thrill ride industry. With a mind-bending seating system that allowed riders to flip head over heels, it promised an unparalleled experience. However, the ambition of such a groundbreaking technology proved too much for its manufacturer Aerodynamics to handle. Despite the initial excitement, X faced numerous challenges and flaws that led to its reimagining as X2. But why exactly was the original X a failure? Let's find out today, right here on Theme Park Crazy. Our story begins in 1946 with the founding of American manufacturer Aero Development. After a few years of selling used tools and repairing cars, the company got into the amusement industry by building merry-go-rounds and miniature car rides. Later on in 1953, the company contacted Walt Disney and offered their services for the upcoming Disneyland theme park in California. Aero would work on the ride systems for several opening day attractions, including Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, The Mad Tea Party, and Casey Jr.'s Circus Train. Shortly after the park's opening in 1955, Aero went on to design another major attraction for Disneyland, but this one was much bigger in scale. In collaboration with Disney's Imagineers, Aero designed a revolutionary roller coaster. This attraction featured an innovative track design which consisted of tubular steel rails. These rails allowed for more efficient manufacturing, keeping their uniform diameter even through tight turns. In 1959, the new coaster named Matterhorn Bobsleds made its debut to instant acclaim from parkgoers. With that, Aero Development became the hottest name in the amusement industry. They went on to design several more attractions for amusement parks, including an antique cars ride for Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk and the slow-moving Danny the Dragon ride at San Jose's Happy Hollow. Unfortunately, Aero struggled financially, as the ambitious projects for Disneyland took a toll on their resources. Fortunately, Walt Disney was eager to help the company because of all they did for his park. Walt personally paid off their debt and purchased a one-third stake in the company, helping keep them afloat. The next few decades would see Aero skyrocket in popularity. After building the world's first log flume El Aceradero at Six Flags Over Texas, the company introduced their second roller coaster named Runaway Mine Train at the same park. Then, in 1975, the company premiered the world's first modern looping steel coaster, Corkscrew at Knott's Berry Farm. This ride, known as the Corkscrew model, was initially quite successful. However, just a decade after its installation, Aero found themselves in a tight spot. In addition to a costly participation in the 1984 World's Fair, the company, then known as Aero Hoss, had spread themselves too thin. Simply put, they took on more ride projects than they could afford to build. Fortunately, the company bounced back from the abyss, rebranding themselves as Aerodynamics. Soon afterwards, they took up several high-profile projects. They would end up building several record-breaking coasters including Vortex at Kings Island, Shockwave at Six Flags Great America, and Magnum XL200 at Cedar Point. These coasters were on a far grander scale than their usual affairs, but many of their later creations faced severe technical issues. Many of them had used the same track profiling and train designs as Aero's older, smaller coasters. This meant that their old design methods were unsuitable for larger scale attractions. Coasters like Shockwave and Steel Phantom at Kennywood were infamous for giving rough and uncomfortable rides. As the 90s approached, Aero faced stiff competition from Swiss manufacturer Bolliger & Mabillard, or B&M for short. This company introduced a new track design that was better suited to handle large, intense elements. Coasters like Batman the Ride at Six Flags Great America and Kumba at Busch Gardens Tampa were highly praised for their smoothness and revolutionary design. It seemed like Aero's outdated methods would sink the company's business, but one man would soon turn its reputation around for the better. Allow me to introduce you to Alan Schilke, one of the most influential and important coaster designers of the modern era. After several years of working for Aerodynamics, Schilke eventually ascended to the rank of head engineer. In the late 90s, he showcased his talents by designing Tennessee Tornado at Dollywood, the latter of which was considered to be a huge step up from the company's past coasters thanks to a newer track profiling. But Schilke's imagination and creativity didn't stop there. 
In fact, he wanted to take the concept of the roller coaster to the next level, or rather, the next dimension. At the age of 12, Shilke was riding the famous Zipper Carnival ride when he was struck by inspiration. Intrigued by the Zipper's front and back flipping gondolas, he set out to incorporate this element into the world of roller coasters. This ambition led him to conceive the brand new concept of a fourth dimension roller coaster. This balls to the wall design has riders seated not above the track, but on the sides of it. The most insane thing about this ride is the ability of the seats to flip forwards and backwards a full 360 degrees. Through the use of a rack and pinion gear system, a special quadruple rail design allows the ride to coast along the inside rails while the outside ones raise and lower to control the seat's rotation. This means that the rotation is completely controlled by the ride designer, guaranteeing the same number of insane flips and dips for each ride. To present his idea in a tangible form, Shilke created a rendering of the imagined prototype as a computer animation on a CD-ROM. Remember those? God, I'm old. While the concept of a fourth dimension roller coaster was groundbreaking on paper, Shilke's colleagues at Aerodynamics were extremely skeptical. In addition to nausea concerns, many believed that such a complex and unique ride was impossible to engineer successfully. Nothing like this had ever been done before, and there was no guaranteeing it would be functional, let alone possible to construct. However, Shilke remained undeterred, confident in the potential of his idea. He kept his CD-ROM on standby, hoping for a future buyer who would recognize the value of its concept. Little did he know that his perseverance would soon pay off, as the idea of a fourth dimension roller coaster would soon find its way to the Six Flags chain of theme parks. In May of 2000, former Six Flags president Gary Story attended a meeting with Aerodynamics officials. Story was shopping for a new thrilling attraction to outdo the park's other aero coaster, Viper, which was around a decade old at that point. During the visit, Shilke simply whipped out his top secret CD-ROM which had been hidden away for five years. With this CD, Shilke was able to show Story his concept for a ride named Fourth Dimension. Story immediately saw potential in this concept and decided to give it the green light. However, he did make one additional request. Instead of the relatively small layout in the CG rendering, he wanted the coaster to be much larger. After all, this was Six Flags Magic Mountain, not a Weenie Hut restaurant. For Story, a park with such a thrilling reputation deserved the biggest and baddest creation. Plus, the coaster would be built right next to the parking lot entrance, so Story wanted to stand out even more to first-time guests. As for the ride's name, Story had another request. Though Shilke had originally named it Fourth Dimension, Story decided to rename it X, making him the first high-level official to rename a property that, as far as I know. Soon afterwards, Shilke, along with a team of engineers, dedicated over 20,000 hours of combined work to develop the coaster. Part of the ride's development involved the construction of a scale test model of the train, which engineers and officials gave a test run. As a whole, the project generated a lot of excitement and buzz in the amusement industry. But behind the scenes, X was metaphorically eating aerodynamics alive. The construction and development of X put an enormous strain on Aero's resources. The company greatly misjudged the cost of construction, and it would end up costing a whopping $45 million to build. To put it bluntly, this coaster was way too ambitious for Aero's own good. Even worse, while the coaster was scheduled to open in the summer of 2001, unspecified design flaws caused significant delays. In fact, it wouldn't be until 2002 that the ride opened, but shortly before it did, Aerodynamics would fall into bankruptcy for the second and last time. The company cited debts of over $3.8 million to unsecured creditors. Much of X's cost went into research and development. All in all, the monetary turmoil X presented helped kill off perhaps the most influential manufacturer in roller coaster history. It is worth noting though that another major factor in the company's closure was their cancelled fish hook coaster in Las Vegas. But that story is worthy of its own video. While the proposed coaster could have saved Arrow from going under if it was successful, the project falling apart combined with the financial strain of X both played significant roles in the company's demise. But the story doesn't end there, because not only did X help kill Arrow, it would also be a continuous headache for Six Flags. Officials at Six Flags filed claims against Arrow, demanding over $5.8 million due to X's delays and difficulties. Nevertheless, they were determined to finish their newest major attraction and persevered with the coaster's construction. 
After months of delays and dealing with Arrow's bankruptcy, Six Flags managed to get the ride open to the public on January 12, 2002. The ride experience went as followed. After departing the station, the train ascends the lift hill with a top height of 175 feet. After reaching the peak, the train briefly dips down before approaching the main drop. This nearly vertical drop is 215 feet, classifying X as a hypercoaster. At the descent, the seats turn so the riders face the ground. This makes the phrase, don't look down, as pointless as trying to dodge rain in a deluge. After the drop is what's known as an inside raven turn, where the cars rotate halfway through, going from face up to face down. Passengers then navigate an airtime hill and a backflip before a large sweeping turnaround. This is followed by a half twist element and yet another wild rotation. First time riders may expect to navigate this twist normally, but the way the seats rotate during this element gives the illusion that the train has left the track. After another quick dip is a smaller raven turn packed with g-forces. This ends the ride with a bang before the final break run. Upon its debut, X was hugely praised among thrill seekers. Coaster enthusiasts flocked to this ride, excited to check out its unmatched forces and surreal movements. Indeed, it seemed that despite all of the headaches with Arrow, Six Flags would be able to add yet another incredible coaster to its resume. However, the coaster itself had other plans. Almost immediately, X faced extended downtime, opening either later in the afternoon or not at all on some days. Even worse, the park would often operate only one train at a time, causing wait times of up to five hours. Along with unspecified technical issues, the biggest problem with the coaster was the weight of the trains. Each train weighed a whopping 25 tons, that's over four adult African elephants. The trains were so heavy that two 300 horsepower engines were needed to lift them uphill. Because they weighed so much, the trains put much more stress on the track and support structure than anticipated, causing a lot of downtime. Another problem with the coaster was the restraint system. While the design was ergonomic and comfortable, the mechanical system would jam easily. The system relied on cables, levers, foot pedals, and actuators, basically making it a less efficient Minecraft creation. This hampered throughput and led to longer waits and lower guest satisfaction. Speaking of wait times, it didn't help that the station was divided into loading and unloading sections. After one group of passengers disembarked, the train had to be moved forward to the boarding station, wasting valuable seconds that could have been used to load a new set of passengers. Also worth noting was the vast amount of power needed to run the coaster. According to Forbes magazine, 1.1 million volt amps were needed to run X. That's twice the amount of an average roller coaster and enough to power the Empire State Building. It's unknown if the excessive power demands played a role in its downtime, but it's certainly possible. By June of 2002, Six Flags made the decision to close the coaster due to quote-unquote design issues. At this point, park officials were likely livid behind the scenes. Their newest attraction, which was supposed to be a crown jewel in their lineup, had failed to deliver a problem-free performance. Due to the ride's problems, Six Flags started to get cold feet about investing in large, ambitious prototypes. According to Theme Park Insider, Six Flags officials said they would be slashing their capital investments the same month that X went down. Many feared that X's failure would turn parks off of adding major unique roller coasters and hamper innovation in the industry. Fortunately, while Aero's story ended tragically, the coaster itself did see its fortunes turn around. After almost six years of operation as X, Six Flags made the decision to give this problematic coaster a major makeover. In 2007, the ride closed for an extensive $10 million refurbishment. While the track layout remained the same, substantial changes were still made to the attraction. Gone was the old X, and in was the new and improved X2. First, the pink and yellow paint scheme was changed to a more fitting red, gray, and black color palette. Secondly, new special effects were added, including fog and a timed fire effect. Most importantly, a new set of trains was introduced. These trains were built by American manufacturer SNS Worldwide, now known as SNS Sansei. This company purchased Aero's assets shortly after they went bankrupt and had the right to build fourth dimension coasters. SNS's engineers had meticulously scrutinized every aspect of the original design to greatly improve the trains. Weight reduction emerged as a primary goal, and this objective drove major changes to the train's structure. Assessed were areas where additional strength was needed. 
all while identifying opportunities for lightening the load. One thing that was replaced were the original rods that held the seats, known as pickle forks. The new chassis was much simpler, designed to have less parts and be remarkably lighter. Unnecessary weight was removed from the suspended cantilever assembly, which promised much less wear and tear on the track. In total, engineers managed to take 20,000 pounds off the trains. Moreover, SNS aimed to improve the restraints. They did this by removing the old complex mechanical system and replacing it with a pneumatic one. This could be controlled by the ride operator at the simple push of a button. Not only did these restraints allow for swift and easy adjustments of the harnesses, but they also significantly increased the ride's capacity and throughput. And speaking of throughput, the loading and unloading system was changed as well, being done on only one station instead of two. Funnily enough, while the weight was reduced in many ways, an onboard audio system was added to the trains, which would play an audio track time with the ride's layout. All of these changes, along with a newly designed set of wheels, promised to help the coaster fulfill its potential. In May 2008, X2 made its debut to the public. Many agreed that the ride was better than ever, being more functional as well as better looking and more exciting with the new effects. Today, X2 is not only considered one of the park's best coasters, but among the best roller coasters of all time. Overall, it's true that the original X was a failure in some ways. Not only did it fail to bring success to aero development, but its initial opening was a complete nightmare for Six Flags. But while it is sad that it contributed to Arrow's demise, you'd be hard pressed to call the coaster itself a complete failure. Alan Schilke gave the coaster world a true gem, persevering to get a ride built that many considered to be impossible. Though some had predicted X would cause the industry to pull back on innovation, the coaster market is continuing to create new and exciting attractions to this day. SNS would even go on to build two more of these attractions in Asia. As roller coasters continue to evolve, X2 stands as a testament to the magic of engineering, and it will continue to delight thrill seekers for generations to come. Now it's time for the comment shoutout program. This is where I take five random comments from my previous video and read them out. These comments are from my video on the top 30 intense thrill rides. Lucas42 says, Thanks for this great video. For me, flat rides, especially the thrilling ones, are equally as interesting as roller coasters, and I always appreciate it when these attractions get some love. Thanks for the compliment, Lucas. Claudia Mastio says, The top spin at number 10 used to have an even cooler variation at Movie Land called Tomb Raider. As the two arms of the gondola spun independently of one another so the gondola was tilting, twisting, and spinning on itself. Silver X721 says, My Nana and Pop love telling the story of their experience on the zipper. Especially my Pop. He always tells me about how they went on it while on a date and the door flew open mid-ride. He managed to stop my Nana from falling out and boasts about how he saved her. I don't know how lol, but it's an interesting yet terrifying story. My parents wouldn't let me on the ride when I was younger either. They told me I could ride it when I turned 18, leading me to believe it was an adult ride lmao. And now I have an irrational fear of it. Chloe.com.au5 says, As an Australian who has been to very few fairs, I was surprised to see any rides I'd ridden. Power Surge was definitely more intense than the Roundup. The Roundup wasn't intense at all. I've always wanted to go on Speed XXL, but it's either been very busy or out of order. Gravitron wasn't intense at all. It's very common in Australian fairs. I know there is a rotor at Sydney Luna Park, but I haven't ridden it. And finally, the zipper is also fairly common in Australia, but I am yet to ride it. And Ali Kuma says, I definitely used to turn myself upside down in the Gravitron. LOL, my stomach couldn't handle these rides now, but all of them look insanely fun. The zipper was the only ride to make me cry. I was 11, LOL. If you want to see your words in my next video, leave a comment down below and it may be selected. Please note though that inflammatory or spam comments will not be read. Thank you all so much, and if you want to support me on Patreon, you can do so once again at the link in the description. Thanks for watching everyone. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or you can check out my website at themeparkcrazy.com. And I'm on TikTok. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time.